The second of our five general reaction types that I'm going to discuss are decomposition reactions. And you've heard this idea of things decomposing before, like a dead fish washes up on the beach and decomposes, or a tree branch falls off into the woods and then decomposes, right? To break down, I think, is the basic idea, right? So breaking down. Now, for specific terms, if we're going to put this like we said, synthesis was two or more species combining to make one compound. Decomposition has to be the opposite of that. All right, and there's a little fine print, but we're going to say you have one compound breaking down to form two or more species. Two or more species. And I'm trying to be careful when I phrase these things. You, you are starting with a compound. You could be breaking it into s different compounds, or you could be breaking it into elements. So I'm just going to use species, right? Our catch-all for things. And uh, as a quick little reminder here, uh, our general form for synthesis was A plus X goes to AX. So our general form for decomposition must be the reverse of that, right? AX turning into A plus X. And boy, is that an understatement. At first glance, I think that synthesis seems like it should be the easiest. You just combine stuff. And then if we were to line things up, I think the decomposition should be the second easiest. But things can get really complicated. The good news is, I think, in general, the basic idea of decomposition is pretty straightforward. Then we get into special cases. So we'll look at the generic uh, cases first, and then we'll look at some special cases after that. Before we do that, there's a little more information I want to discuss about decomposition reactions. And it's just worth mentioning some common ways to initiate decomposition reactions. All right, and uh, you, can, you can ponder this on your own, but like, if not triggered, some things might not decompose, right? But if you leave, like I used the example earlier, this fish washes up on the beach, it sits in the hot sun and starts to decay, right? Well, the heat is generally a good way to initiate a decomposition reaction, so heat or light, okay? Uh, a second way that I think is going to come up in a little bit is electricity, right? We call that electrolysis, right? Where you're using electricity to cause a chemical reaction. All right, and then the third option we have here is a catalyst. And that's terminology that most people have heard before. Uh, you can be a catalyst for change or something like that. Uh, it's a kinetics term, right? A catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction without being consumed in the net reaction, right? So you can look at the kinetics video for a little more detailed study of what catalysts do. They provide an alternate reaction pathway that has a lower activation energy. That's the words that go with that, right? gives you a different way to get from reactants and products, and that way happens to be uh, more energetically favorable in terms of the activation energy. But for general definition, a catalyst is some uh, species that speeds up a reaction without being consumed in the net reaction. Speeds up a reaction, that's the first part of that, and then without being consumed in the net reaction. All right, so there's two parts to this. Without being consumed in the net reaction is the other part. So, you know, in middle school or whatever, if you hear, what does a catalyst do? The answer is speeds up a reaction. Well, there's more to it. A catalyst gets used in the reaction, and that's what speeds it up, but you get it back, right? So the two parts to that are it's used, and then it's produced. So we get it back, right? And uh, when you're looking at these things here, We'll very often show these right uh, above the arrow, right? So we're going to see them right there above the arrow as we write these chemical reactions. All right, we got some general idea there. 
Uh, let's take a look at some uh, generic simple decomposition reactions and we'll work our way up from there. The first one that I want to take a look at is maybe the decomposition of hydrochloric acid or something, right? And it's a made up example, but if you've got HCl, right? And you want it to break apart. The only things it can make are hydrogen and chlorine, and those happen to be diatomic species. So you get H2 and Cl2, right? We do need to balance that. We'll set up our table. We've got hydrogen and chlorine, one and one, two and two. You can look at that and say, yeah, it's not balanced. If you put a two there, we get a two and a two, and all of a sudden it's balanced. There you go. 2HCl breaks down into H2 and Cl2 although I don't think that's probably going to happen. So the idea with synthesis, we said, the things you start with have to be combined in your products, right? And then you get the formula by crisscrossing and reducing. In a decomposition reaction, you need to make whatever the pieces are, right? So in this case, our pieces had to be hydrogen and chlorine. And it can be a little more confusing than that, but that's the basis of how we're gonna handle our decomposition reactions for now, all right? Let's say we've got something like ammonia, NH3, all right? Again, you look at it and your first response is, well, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. It's gotta make something nitrogen, something hydrogen. So you write your two products, all right? Well, nitrogen is a diatomic species. Hydrogen is a diatomic species. That's, that's what it makes, right? And so we need to balance this. We set up our table of reactants and products. We've got nitrogen and hydrogen, one and three. On the product side, two and two. It's not balanced. We looked at this reaction as a synthesis reaction, and one of the strategies I had suggested was, if you see in a, a two and a three, or you see odds and evens of the same thing, you're probably going to have to find some least common multiple, right? And if you don't like those words, two and three are gonna meet at six, right? I'll need three of those, right? And um, that's gonna give me six, hydrogens. And then if I put two of these, that's going to give me six hydrogens and conveniently two nitrogens. And then it's balanced as the work shows, right? Um, I didn't mention it in this video and it is something that has come up before, but when we're looking at these diatomic species like hydrogen and chlorine and nitrogen, do remember in their elemental state, meaning when they are by themselves, not as an ion, they're diatomic, right? They're bonded to themselves. And there's many ways to remember which ones are diatomic and which ones aren't. But a common one is Hofbrinkel, right? H-O-F-B-R-I-N-C-L, all right? When any of those species is by themselves, they're gonna be diatomic. Um, I've heard people uh, use Han and the halogens, right? H-O-N, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and the halogens, right? Chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine. Uh, Charlotte Ray, who was a <laughs> superstar teacher in Kentucky here, who I uh, mentored me when I started, used to use Han and the halogens. She said, oh, it's like a rock band, Han and the halogens, right? Anyway, um, Hofbrinkel, I think, is easy enough to remember, or Han and the halogens. When they are by themselves in their elemental state, they are diatomic. There's two of them bonded together. And once in a while, people will ask, like, why are they diatomic? Why are these special? And uh, the answer is something you can see with our Lewis structures, right? Hydrogen, one valence electron. Hydrogen, one valence electron. Single valence electrons or unpaired valence electrons tend to be high energy states. So hydrogen can bond to itself to get to a lower energy state. Or you can see something like chlorine, right? Chlorine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Another chlorine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Each is an uh, uneven number of electrons. They bond together. Each of them has eight and obeys the octet rule. And then you've seen these Lewis structures before, but oxygen, for instance, double bond. Nitrogen, classic example of a triple bond, yeah? So those are all things that exist in their diatomic state, in their elemental state. So when you hear me mention that, watch for those things. That's a real common one uh, people miss, is when you are producing the pieces of this, they're gonna be a diatomics. And when we talked about synthesis, we had said in the reverse, don't assume that these twos carry over, right? Because this is what it is by itself, this is what it is by itself, that's what the compound is, and I need to crisscross and reduce to get that formula. All right, enough words, let's keep moving here. Um, 
we'll work in some of the uh, symbols we used up there. If we get H2O, water, right, we can electrolyze it. Yeah, we can run electricity through it. And literally, we put the word electricity above the arrow because that's what we're adding in. And if you're wondering what's going to happen here, well, what are the things I have? The things I have are hydrogen and oxygen. And what I'm going to get is hydrogen and oxygen. Oh, yeah, they're diatomics. So I will have a 2 and a 2. As always, we better check our balancing reactants and products. We've got hydrogen and oxygen. On the reactant side, 2 and 1. Product side, 2 and 2. Looks like it's not balanced. We want to get uh, two of the oxygens on the reactant side. That two will also affect our hydrogens. Not balanced yet. But if we double the hydrogens on that side, we'll end up with four. And now it's balanced, right? All right. Um, let's try another one here. And I just want to give us kind of a sampling of decompositions with different charge states. And then, like I said, we'll work our way up to special decomposition reactions. So... Let's try here tin and sulfur, so tin four sulfide, SNS2, right? And we'll just say that that is decomposing. You have to tell yourself, like, well, I don't know what it's going to make. Yes, you do. It's got to make tin, and it's got to make sulfur, right? And then I will set up the table of reactants and products, though I do have to restrain myself from not just putting a two in there, right? Uh, tin and sulfur, one and two, one and one. I think we can handle this if we put a two right there. All right. Similarly, we can look at one like maybe uh, silicon dioxide, SiO2, glass, or any number of silica rocks, SiO2, right? Guess what it makes? Silicon and oxygen. But oxygen is one of those diatomics, so we have O2. This is kind of a nice one in terms of balancing because... Silicon and oxygen, one and two, one and two, and we're all set. I know it feels like uh, I'm wasting room, but we're going to have to go to a new video when we get to the special decomposition, so I have all this space to kill right now. All right, um, we're going to do two more generic ones, and then one that's slightly less intuitive, and then we'll end this video on general decomposition, and we'll do a separate video with special decomposition reactions. Um, PbCl4, when it breaks down, you have to have lead, right? And you're going to have to have chlorine. And there we go. It is not balanced as written, but we need to show the work anyway. It's process-oriented, sciences, and people need to be able to see what we did. 1 and 4, 1 and 2, in case you didn't notice, it's not balanced. But if we put a 2 there, it is balanced, right? Magnesium nitride. There's a common lab that colleges do and some high schools do where you take magnesium metal and you heat it up in a ceramic crucible and um, it burns in the oxygen. And it's a controlled rate because you limit the amount of oxygen that goes in. But since oxygen's from the air and magnesium burns really hot, some of that magnesium can react with the nitrogen in the air and you get magnesium nitride. And it's kind of interesting because of that magnesium nitride will react with water, and you get magnesium oxide and uh, nitrogen gas or something. I don't remember. Uh, all right. Well, I think that this has to produce magnesium and nitrogen, right? And we looked at this in the synthesis uh, reaction type video in reverse, right? And it makes sense that that's how things would look. We'll set up our table here of reactants and products. We've got magnesium and nitrogen. Oops. <laughs> Don't do that. We've got three magnesiums and two nitrogens. We've got one magnesium and two nitrogens. Nitrogen looks good. We're going to need to fix the magnesium by putting a three there, and we're balanced. All right, the last reaction I'm going to sneak in right here is a very common reaction. That's why I want us to write it down. It's not super intuitive, but it's common enough that I think everybody should know it. And that's the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. All right. Um, most likely in your medicine cabinet, you have hydrogen peroxide. It's in a brown bottle, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it's light sensitive, right? So in um, one of our kinetics videos, I talked about how 
ultraviolet light could break down chlorine, diatomic chlorine, well, electromagnetic radiation can break apart this hydrogen peroxide, right? H, O, O, H. It turns out that this bond right here is really weak. And so electromagnetic radiation light will break that apart. And so I could put light up here or whatever. That's why they put the hydrogen peroxide in a brown bottle so it do doesn't decompose as quickly. You're also supposed to store it in a cool area because uh, heat will decompose it, right? I'm sure you could do electrolytic decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. And a common one is to do um, a catalyzed decomposition of manganese uh, with of peroxide using manganese dioxide. All right. Um, as we look at it, like based on the instructions I was giving here, you'd say, oh, that's going to turn into hydrogen and oxygen. But that's not actually the case, and that's why I want to mention this one. You end up with, yes, oxygen gas, but H2O2 turns into H2O and O2. All right. And we'll balance that, and then we'll talk a little bit about the real world relations of this equation. We'll see where we go from there. All right, it's not balanced, in case you didn't notice. Uh, we need to get, and again, you could say to yourself, like, oh, a two and a three, but I think it's worth noting. Oxygen's by itself here. Oxygen's in a compound there. Evens, odds, evens. Uh, let's, let's get evens, okay? There's no way to make this side odd without a fraction, so I'm gonna need to get rid of the odds over here. And if you don't like those words, it's not a big deal. Balance them. If you can balance it, that's what matters, right? Balance it, show your work. That's science. Do what you need to do. As long as you can show your work and somebody can duplicate it, that's what matters. All right. I do have my product side hydrogens now as four. I have my product side oxygens as two, three, four. And then I'm going to have to go to the reactant side and double that as four and four. I know our biology department used to do a lab where they would uh, take chicken liver or something and mix it with peroxide and the catalase enzyme would decompose it. So it was a catalytic decomposition of hydrogen peroxide using that. And it's similar uh, to the catalase in your blood. Like very often people put uh, peroxide on cuts. And like I've heard different reasons for this. Like, well, a simple one would be that peroxide, peroxide oxidizes, right? And it would kill stuff. So I guess that's a possibility. Peroxide um, decomposes in that catalase enzyme to produce oxygen gas, and I've been told that that oxygen gas is good at killing anaerobic bacteria that might cause an infection. Um, and then I've also heard that like the water that's produced or the water that's in it rinses out the cut and that bubbling helps. Uh, within the past several years, uh, it's been reported, I think like the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics or whatever, that uh, you should stop using peroxide in cuts because it does do good, but it also does some harm. I think it oxidizes the tissue a bit. I, I, people have been doing it forever. I'm sure it doesn't matter, but it's just an interesting side note. All right, overshadowing idea for decomposition reactions. Uh, something turns into its pieces, right? And if those pieces are diatomic, don't forget that. You can initiate things this way, and uh, don't forget that reaction. We need to do some special decomposition reactions, and we'll take care of that in the next video.